chainsaw or something to them, and that there ought to be some use for them. Good morning. Let's uh, start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I just want to start off by thanking the department and everybody for the function last night. That was unbelievable. It was wonderful looking at everybody's faces and all those people seeing people they haven't seen in years. I thought that was pretty cool. So thank you very much. Chief Al. Good morning, President Duby, Commissioners, Director Nesbitt. Um, this morning, it's my honor to uh, present a 20 year service award to Joe Gillis. Joe, if you want to come on up. So um, Joe is one of our um, senior fish culturists uh, that we have around the state, which is a essentially assistant superintendent at the hatchery. He's located at Boulder right now. Um, but Joe started in 2001 and as a culturist in, at Boulder. And uh, in 2015, he was uh, promoted to a senior culturist. Um, these guys always amaze me at the hatcheries, how um, they are able to do a lot with a little. Um, and uh, Joe is no exception to that. At Boulder, if you haven't been there, um, that's our brood stock for our fall rainbows. And uh, Joe has been instrumental in uh, the production of uh, fall rainbows. In fact, right now, um, they're doing egg takes every Tuesday. And that's why Joe's here today, because they were doing egg takes yesterday. In fact, he was just telling me this morning how what kind of demand there is on our fall rainbow eggs right now. Um, in fact, we're you're we're going to be shipping off to Maryland, isn't that correct, this year? So they're going all over the country. Um, and that's just because of the high quality of the eggs that these guys produce. Um, also, at uh, Boulder, we have the East Fork facility, which we have um, bluehead suckers, plant of mouth suckers, and round tailed chubs, uh, three species that are uh, a sensitive species, they're native species. You know, we're pretty fortunate in Wyoming to only have one fish species that is on the endangered species list. And that's the Kendall Warm Community Basin. So uh, the management section and the hatchery sections um, have done a lot of work on, on trying to keep these guys off the list. And uh, the, the work that they do there um, in holding these fish over for repatriation and also production right now this was the first year, wasn't it, Joe, that you guys um, tried to spawn plant of mouth and the bluehead's? Or was it second? Second year, second successful year. Second successful uh, year with bluehead's, and and uh, I stopped in there one day, and they're just tiny, tiny little goobers. But um, so they they do a lot of great work there, and then and then lastly, the uh, I think you're all familiar with the flood mitigation project that we had going on at Boulder there. And uh, that's finally um, was done this past year. And Joe was really instrumental on uh, having that project come to completion. So um, I just want to say thank you to Joe for all his hard work, 20 years. It's a long time and uh, really appreciate him making the trip over here and, and uh, to receive the award. Do you want to speak? <laughs> Yeah, me too. Ralph's gonna photo bomb the picture. <laughs> 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 that was not pretty. <laughs> 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 like when you go to Jake's and go see somebody high five and they just walk in. What's that? Exactly. 
<clears throat> just <laughs> I think it's kind of in the air up here or something after <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> I see we have some legends in the house here. Mr. Anselmi, Mr. Pate, Mr. Crank, thank you. <laughs> you still have the glasses. <laughs> Got the glasses. Dan's not here yet, is he? Yep. He is here? I saw him just a little bit ago. We're good to go? Okay, Ray. Number 22 on the agenda. Uh, good morning, Commissioners, President Duby, members of the Commission. I'm here today to present you with our Renner Wildlife Habitat Management Area Farming and Grazing Plan. Um, we present these to you anytime we have a special use that lasts longer than a year, it requires your approval. Um, so just a little history on our Renner Wildlife Habitat Management Area. Um, <clears throat> So Renner is located about five miles southeast of Hyattville. Um, we acquired it in 1979 for the purpose of providing a big game winter range. Renner is approximately 15,725 acres. Uh, of that, 4,464 acres are commissioned fee title. Um, the rest of that is pretty much BLM land. So we work cooperatively with the BLM on this property as well. Um, part of Renner is uh, there's 120 acres of hay meadows that are irrigated. And then we also have 112 acres of wetlands that are also fed off that same system. <clears throat> so kind of hard to see, but so the upper portion, this east portion is closed annually from January through May 31st to protect wintering wildlife. This lower portion is open year round. We have a reservoir right here called Renner Reservoir, which is very popular in the Cody region for a warm water fishery. It's actually fed off a artesian well, um, and it's known for its largemouth bass. We actually, um, this is Renner Reservoir, just kind of gives you an idea of the land out there. Um, we actually redid a, the outlet structure, um, dug, uh, dredged out a bunch of channels, added some islands for birds back in 2018, our statewide crew did. So um, Renner has now basically been reestablished. So, <clears throat> but on with the grazing plan. So the, uh, as I mentioned, we work with the BLM so in cooperation with the BLM and us, uh, we manage Renner for wildlife habitat. Um, so the wildlife needs are paramount in the shared management of this. Um, as you can see, Renner has eight distinct pastures that we use. Um, we do kind of a deferred grazing out there. Uh, we, so our overall strategy is to manage the area that uh, when elk partition, that there's no cattle in those areas during that time, um, to improve, improve plant vigor and vegetative growth by removing decadent herbaceous material. Um, we're maintaining adequate year long habitat for elk and high quality forage in their winter and transitional ranges. Um, we also maintain high quality habitat for the mule deer down in these lower pastures. So. Um, the elk have tendency to hang out up here, and these are our lower pastures. 
for the meal there. Um, as I mentioned, we actually only allow 525 AUMs on this whole property. Um, and of that, since about 70, 73% of those are on BLM and the rest is on us. Along with that, we also have farming. So these are the hay meadows that we have on Renner. And then these are the wetlands I was talking about as well. Um, so the, the uh, part of the grazing and lease, grazing and farming plan is they also get to hay those meadows. They irrigate them for us. They work on the infrastructure. Um, they can get one cutting later in June, and then they have to re-irrigate and leave the regrowth for wildlife for the winter. The, we make them hay later so they don't disturb any of the waterfowl or upland bird broods that use that area. <clears throat> so our uh, current lease is about, their lease is about to expire. They've actually been the operator out there for 27 years. So we have a good relationship with them. Um, in October, we sent out requests, to, requests for proposals to uh, multiple folks in the area that were interested in leasing Renner. Uh, after a bid showing, we ended up with three folks that showed up. Um, and then in the end, our current lease did put an RFP in and they scored the highest. So we ranked their proposals on, you know, have they worked with us in the past? Do we have a good relationship with them? Do they have the manpower to actually do this? How close are they in proximity to the property? Um, can they actually hay? Do they have, do they know what they're doing out there basically? Um, and then we also have in there a value. Um, so they have an annual lease payment that they propose to us. We don't take a lease payment. We actually put it back into the property. So that's through what we call an AIPA, an area improvement project agreement. So if, say they had a $10,000 lease agreement, that goes back into the property and fence maintenance, weeds, irrigation infrastructure. So we never see the money. It's, they show us what they've done and we sign off on it every year. And that's negotiated every year on what they're going to do. So they, they propose to you the improvements or whatnot mm -hmm. on the property that they will do. So that's the in-kind. Yep. Yep. So that's their lease payment. Do you, as the Game of Fish, you folks have any input as to what you want done? Yes. Oh yeah. So is, so that's we, part of, is that part of the, yep. the proposal? <clears throat> yep. So they'll propose like on their RFP, they just propose, this is how much we're going to pay right. annually. And then we meet yearly with them on where we want that money to go right. technically. So how do you handle the BLM lease? That must, that has to be in their name, doesn't it? You so can't it's sublease. Actually, yeah. So we um, work cooperatively with the BLM. So we have an MOU with them on that this will be managed for wildlife habitat and we actually run the grazing agreement so we lease it and then the blm whoever we lease it to we hold the allotment in a way and it's leased back to uh, the current lease that we have so similar to our red rim grizzly country we most of that's blm but we control who the lease is out there yeah because i know you know like we can't sublease blm nope. Nope. Yeah, getting a little bit of trouble for that yeah uh, <laughs> so um so with that i'd be up for any questions i'm basically uh, i'm asking for your guys' approval for a 10-year uh, <clears throat> sorry basically i'm asking for approval for a 10-year grazing plan and farming plan with the option to renew for an additional 10 years on the renter wildlife habitat management area any questions for Ray? Okay, I'd entertain a motion. I'd so move. Second. Moved by Commissioner Brokaw, second by <clears throat> Commissioner Bird to accept the department's recommendation on the Renner 10 year grazing plan with the option to renew for additional 10 years. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, Good thank job. you, Ray. Thank you. Dan, are you ready now? Got the kids dropped off?
We're all anxious. We're all anxiously awaiting. I your... guess. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> members of the commission, uh, President Duby, it's my honor to, to introduce Dan Bjornley from the large carnivore section. He's going to be giving you this talk about some of the work we did this summer that was it's actually pretty exciting. As far as we know, it's the first time it's occurred in the lower 48. And uh, Dan has really built up our grizzly bear monitoring program to the point where it's at today. To success, he's been through two successful delisting of the grizzly bear. Unfortunately, he's also been part of two relistings of the grizzly bear, but um, that was out of a scope of what we can do. But Dan's been involved, heavily involved with grizzly bears and, and black bears in the state. He serves on the North American Bear Expert Team for the International Bear Association. And I will turn it over to Dan. Thank you, uh, President Duby. Uh, members of the commission. Uh, yeah, I'd like to talk, there we go, a uh, little bit today about what, uh, what we did this summer um, and a process that has gone on for, I think, five or six years that we've been working on trying to, to make this happen. And just a little bit of the background on, on why we decided we needed to try this uh, method for grizzly bear capture and then a little bit on the results and how it turned out. <clears throat> there we go. So just a little background on our grizzly bear population monitoring program overall. Um, we do what we call research monitoring uh, trapping where we radio collar <laughs> grizzly bears throughout Wyoming in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, and what we're doing is trying to maintain a representative sample of, of different areas, different uh, sex and age classes of bears, and try to get, not sure what's going on with our flashing screen there, but um, trying to get a little bit of information from all different areas and uh, cohorts of the bear population. We do this in front country and back country. So front country, meaning a situation like this, if you see in the background, there's a culvert trap there. We haul those in with trucks and we can take those to a lot of places where we have road access. But we also do some back country work uh, by horseback and uh, using cable foot snares to capture and collar bears in areas where we don't have road access. <clears throat> And the information we get from these collars, we can uh, get survival estimates for the population, reproduction by observing uh, females that have cubs, and also habitat use from our GPS collar locations that we get from most of the collars we're putting out these days are GPS collars um, with some old style VHF that, that lasts longer so we can get better information on survival and reproduction. But then while we're handling that bear, we're also getting things on uh, body measurements, physiology, um, genetics, body condition, um, many, many, many different things that we're getting out of these uh, diet information from stable isotopes from their hair samples that we get. So we get a ton of information from these capture events. <clears throat> And in addition, we also, under this umbrella of like habitat use, we have a fairly unique situation in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem where we have army cutworm moth sites. And they tend to be in the Absorca Mountains to, uh, between Cody and Dubois, high elevation areas where grizzly bears go up and feed in talus slopes and they dig up army cutworm moths. And if you can see on this, picture right here, these are grizzly bears. I think there's five or six of them just in this one little spot and they're all digging uh, in the snow, well, in the rock, there's one in the snow there, but they're digging for army cutworm moths. These bears are extremely difficult to access for our research trapping and monitoring because of the area they inhabit, the rugged terrain, inaccessible uh, road system. And so this has always been kind of a data deficient area for us um, and to try to get collars into. And we've, we've tried a lot of different things as far as uh, backcountry trapping on horseback to get into these areas. But one of the major complications is these sites usually start um, in July 
usually when the moths and the bears bears get on the moss sites by and by that time the water is still fairly or before that time the water is too high to, to ride horse across safely in many of these areas and so we can't access that country and then by the time the water drops and we can get in there all these bears are up on the moss sites and you can't get to them there's no you know it's pretty hard to access with horse and once we're there you can't trap it because there are no trees we can't anchor a snare to a, anything so it makes it really hard to get collars on bears that use these sites <clears throat> but these sites are a high priority for not only us and the grizzly bear study team for learning about bear ecology on the sites but also the u.s forest service who is uh, uh very concerned with the growing interest in uh, human visitation and viewing the moss sites and the potential of human disturbance and bears responses to the human activity on these sites with the potential of maybe pushing grizzly bears off some of these sites if there's too much human activity also potential for just um, uh, human bear conflicts because there are a lot of bears on some of these sites and you know some of these places people come to them to climb peaks they don't even really know it's a moth site they just climb the peak thinking hey this is a cool mountain they get up there and there's 25 grizzly bears up there and it's kind of a surprise to them so um they uh they want a little bit more information on on how humans and bears are interacting and radio collars would really help with that to try to get information on on the bear activity aspect of that um, the forest service has done quite a bit of work on the human activity part, but not as much uh, grizzly bear work. <clears throat> so here's your uh, standard Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, the dark shaded areas are the uh, wilderness areas in the GYE, on the in the Wyoming side anyway. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I'm going to overlay the captures. These are all grizzly bear research monitoring captures that have occurred since 2010. And so if you look at that, you'll see a few pretty distinctive holes in our, our spot, our area of captures. One of them is this, this hole right here. And this is kind of the area that we're talking about, um, focused on the Washiki wilderness, which is the shaded area right here. And that area is, is one of those spots where we just have had real difficulty getting collars on grizzly bears in that country and have for a long time. Zoomed in uh, view of that. And in addition, the shaded area is where almost all the moth sites in the GYE occur. And so you can see there's, there's a huge overlap in, in where these moth sites are where this inaccessible terrain is uh, that we have had difficulty in getting collars and so for abundant reasons we've we've really tried to push getting some collars into this country and so we just we started discussions with the forest service maybe 10 years ago about trying you know what would it take to get uh, permits to do some aerial capture work in wilderness country and it's an arduous process, the permit process, especially. And, and it, it kind of was one of those things where they asked how bad we wanted to do it because it's a big lift for them too. They have a lot of permits that they have to push through themselves. And so it took a couple of years before everybody said, yeah, yeah, we really do want to do this and let's move forward with it. And so that process began uh, in 2016 to try to get this, this underway. And uh, here are a few, few views of just the kind of country we're talking about here and, and what, what it's like and what that accessibility is like. Few, if any, trees, lots of big alpine open country bowls, some snow fields and things like that at this you know, time of year that we'd like to try to do it, um, late June, early July. And so, but, but very few trees or any places like this that we could uh, that we could get some uh, snares to capture bears and then just the accessibility of trying to get there on horseback. So traditionally our backcountry trapping is done by a horseback. And like I said, it requires trees to snare to 
it's extremely labor intensive. We're usually in there for two, maybe three weeks. Um, and, you know, it's pretty gear intensive. We have to bring a lot of things with us to handle bears, capture bears, all the, you know, safety equipment that we need. Um, the trap area we have is pretty small just because you can only access it by a horseback. So you're riding a loop that might be uh, 10 miles a day. And it, it seems like quite a bit, but bears travel a long ways. And that really is a pretty small area to trap compared to what we can do with truck trapping front country where we could cover you know, 30, 40, 50 miles or more in a day. Um, and like I said, it's not possible in many, uh, many of these moss site areas just because of the, of the high elevation and the rugged terrain accessibility. Dan? Yeah. How do you determine a snare location? Do you bait them? Do you, I mean, what, what's their procedure for that? Yeah, we would, we would put a bait out. Um, you know, we select the area beforehand and we find a spot that's away from people that we're not going to run into anyone and, you know, for safety concerns and making sure that that's our number one priority is getting it off to a spot like that. And then but trying to find maybe a travel corridor that a bear would use, um, areas that they would frequent, and then yes, take like we haul in, and that's another logistic effort. You know, hundreds of pounds of, of frozen roadkill, deer and elk, and things like that, on horseback into the backcountry. Then we uh, will put snares around the base of a tree, uh, anchor it to the tree, and um, put a bait there and, and capture them on the uh, horseback and then, you know, deal with all the logistics of actually handling the bear and, you know, darting the bear all done either on foot or horseback. So here uh, is a slide of us going into um, <clears throat> the upper South Fork to a camp that the Forest Service had set up uh, for their field crews. And so we were in there for a couple of uh, years, 2008, 2009. Um, in 2008, we actually caught a few bears, caught three bears, which is pretty good for backcountry. Went back to the same area in 2009 for three, two 10 day hitches and didn't catch any bears, nothing. So, you know, that's kind of how it works. And you can really, really work hard and come up with zero. Um, you know, requires backcountry camps. This is a backcountry cabin in Fox Park in the Teton wilderness um, this year we trapped in there for two weeks didn't catch a single grizzly bear there either so that's the kind of effort that we put in <clears> often to to uh, get that um we do catch bears occasionally um, one of the things you do need to have is some horses that are used to grizzly bears and so um we uh we have horses that have lots of experience with bears and smells and things like that and rotten bait and all of those things that we need to use um they're pretty used to it by now <clears throat> So we began that process 2016. Uh, it was a multi-year effort. Uh, the Forest Service began the, the first part of it with a, what's called an MRDG, which is this minimum requirement decision guide, which goes through the process of, do you really need to do this in wilderness and why and all of those things. Once that process had gone on for, for multiple iterations over a couple of years, we, we obtained a permit our temporary special use permit um, and then um, after that then we had to go through the whole effort of the actual aerial capture part which we worked collaboratively with the park service because we had some folks that had some more experience than we did as far as aerial darting of, of bears and so worked with them got some uh, some operation plans and all the different things that we need to do for that so um, the capture protocol itself, what we did is we reached out to some colleagues from Alaska who had done some bear work, lots of aerial bear work, because this technique is not unique as far as bear capture goes. It happens all the time, Alaska, Scandinavia, Northern Canada, it's kind of the go-to method that they use. Down in the GYE, uh, we believe this is the first aerial capture effort on grizzly bears anywhere in the lower 48. And so uh, it just isn't done down here, really. We use traps more often. We have more road access and things like that. Um, but in Alaska, it's pretty common. So we reached out to some colleagues from the Park Service 
And uh, we got um, an ACETA certified darter and ACETA stands for uh, aerial capture, eradication and tagging of animals. It's a federal acronym for, for the process that they have to certify their, uh, their personnel to do this work. <clears throat> Um, the person we ended up getting who works out of the gates of the Arctic uh, in Alaska is actually an ACETA instructor. And so he's well qualified in all this work. We also reached out to an experienced pilot who uh, has done a lot of wolf work in Yellowstone and, and lots of other wildlife work around the West. And so um, an incredibly talented pilot. He was, he was amazing to watch, actually. He really knew exactly how to uh, put pressure on the animal to make them move to a, maybe a safer spot where it was a better opportunity to dart without really making them run too far too fast and exhausting themselves you know you couldn't know when to pull back and and uh, back off and so it, it was it was pretty incredible to watch and then the usual just helicopter safety protocols that we all have for for using <clears throat> aerial work uh, helicopters especially Specifically, what we had was we had a spotter plane, which was our normal aerial telemetry uh, pilot from Dubois. And he was invaluable. That was kind of what made this whole operation work because he could go ahead of us and find where the bears were and then just contact us on the radio and say, got a bear over here. We go fly over there. If we determined that that was a bear we wanted to try to chase um, and dart, then the protocols state that only the pilot and the darter can be in the, in the helicopter during the actual darting event. So they dropped uh, one of us off and there was myself, Dan Thompson, and then uh, another biologist with us, Justin Clapp, that, that were uh, involved in this. One of us was in the helicopter with those two each of the days that we were out there. We were there, we worked for three days. And um, they would drop one of us off and then dart the bear and then return and pick us up. Sometimes like in this situation right here, you can see this little dot, that's, that's actually Dan Thompson um, up on the ridge there. And if you're close enough, they, you could actually just walk down. And um, because the, uh, we were limited on the number of captures and also the number of landings, we could only do 15 landings in the wilderness. And so by having, someone walk to the site if you were close enough, then you reduce that number of wilderness landings. <clears throat> Sometimes though, they had to come pick you up. This is a shot that Justin took from the high spine of a ridge where it was covered on, on cliffs on all sides. And so in situations like that, they have to come back and pick you up and bring you back over to the bear. <clears throat> and here's an actual clip of the uh, capture, a little bit jerky, but... Um, yeah yeah so they're moving up on the bear he's kind of tilting the helicopter off to the right the pilot or the darter's actually off the right side of the helicopter they come in as soon as that darts in successfully they back off and they let the bear just kind of calm down and usually they stop running as soon as you back off like that and then just back off and observe if they're moving to a place that they don't want, that we wouldn't want them to go, they can come back in and kind of push them away from that spot. But generally just leave them alone until they go down and then go pick up the game and fish personnel, come back and do the workup. And so then it's just a matter of, of a workup like we would normally do anywhere else. We grab all the gear, we come over to the bear and start doing our tagging and collaring and sampling and, and all the different things we do uh, as part of the process. There's uh, me on a, on a bear on a ridge above the gray bowl. And that's Justin Clapp right there. And uh, one of the uh, great things, if you can make it happen is to, is to move them onto a snow field because then when they go down on that snow field, they lay it out flat and it keeps them nice and cool. They don't overheat. Um, we didn't have any issues with anything like that, even on areas where we didn't have uh, snow fields. But, but if you have the opportunity, it's a great option to keep them, uh, keep them cool. This is Kyle Jolly from Gates of the Arctic National Park that uh, was the darter for this operation. So the results of this is uh, 10 grizzly bear captures. We did these 10 captures in three mornings and 
we only worked until about 10 o'clock each day because then the winds would kick up and it'd be kind of too, too, uh, too windy and not really safe to be up much longer than that. So, you know, generally around seven to nine hours of work, we caught 10 grizzly bears. That's the equivalent of 20 years of backcountry horse capture trapping. So, um, and we didn't, we don't always do backcountry trapping every single year, but um, usually every year or two, we're out there doing some type of backcountry horse work. And it, it would take us 20 years to catch 10 bears doing that. So um, we got a good, good, uh, spread of, of sexes, males and females, uh, subadults and adults. Um, seven of the 10 captures were in wilderness and um, got some GPS collars and some VHF collars. The VHF collars we put on adult females because they last longer out to around six years or so. And those bears will have two reproductive cycles during that time. And so we can document reproduction much better that way. <clears throat> Uh, since we did the captures, three of these bears have dropped their collars. They're all adult males. Um, adult males are just really difficult to keep collars on because their necks are bigger than their heads and they just, they slide right off. So, um, so, but um, we did get some great moss site information of the uh, bears that did wear their collars through the moss site period into, July, into August, September all of them extensively used the moss sites. And so that will be great information for our moss site ecology and the forest service in their uh, work to try to, uh, to get some information on bear human activity on moss sites. So back to this view of the, uh, that big hole in our data gap on the, in the Washiki wilderness in the uh, thoroughfare country. There are captures right there, those yellow dots are, are the uh, 10 captures that we had, some outside wilderness, some right on the edge there. Um, <clears throat> and then if you look at actual locations of the bears, the GPS color bears that we got, it filled in that hole very nicely. We got a lot of information and that's just from the first summer. You know, hopefully these collars will stay on. The rest of the GPS collars are scheduled to drop off in July of 2023. And then the VHF collars, they'll stay on um, for probably a couple years more than that. Even so, um, should be some really good information uh, to, uh, to fill a, a pretty huge gap that we've been having for a long time. And then the moss site area, again, just to show that, yes, we had, we had significant activity in the moss site areas and, and specifically on the sites that, uh, that we have documented. Here's a, here's a little figure dish to show again how our, our traditional backcountry trapping, which is right here, and then the aerial captures over here. And this is just captures per effort. So each time we go out, whether it's a backcountry effort for a week, two weeks, three weeks, or whatever, how many captures would we get on that versus, um, you know, and that's kind of on average been about two bears per effort. And so we'll catch, catch a couple of those. And that's usually, like I said, maybe two weeks or so. 10 captures in three mornings of aerial work in the Washakie wilderness. <clears throat> And even at, you know, helicopter is fairly expensive work uh, as far as hourly rates to fly a helicopter, but the time was so short and we had such a efficient process as far as our spotter pilot finding bears for us. The timing was just, you know, one after the other, literally 15 minutes between captures in some cases. And so, and that it comes out to still around 40% cheaper for uh, aerial capture work than backcountry horse captures. So in summary, um, I guess we, we demonstrated that the ability to use this uh, aerial capture you know, method in the GYE is extremely successful. Um, things we learned, um, the spotter pilot is crucial. You have to have somebody up there if you do that. 10, 15 minutes between captures, you can have three captures by nine, 10 o'clock in the morning and you're back in Cody on the ground in time for lunch. And, you know, it's, it's pretty impressive and efficient work. Um, and also there's more area. We were concerned that maybe there wouldn't be enough open alpine area to be able to access these bears and get close and do to be able to capture. But with a really skilled pilot like we had, 
even some of these fairly narrow alpine bowls are are easily used for uh, for captures, and he had plenty of room to maneuver and to successfully get those bears darted. It really it worked well. Um, not appropriate everywhere, of course, because the forested areas were never going to be able to to get darts and in bears from a helicopter in some of those places. Um, you know, front country areas, it's still pretty efficient just to have trucks and, and run culvert traps and do all those things. So, so this isn't something that you could use anywhere, but for this specific area, it was very, very useful. Um, really can't be an annual effort because the permitting process itself takes years to do. And so um, we're hoping that maybe we can do it again, but it's probably gonna be you know, a few more years before we would be able to start that process. And then it would take a couple of years beyond that to get the permits through. Once again, we would have to, it's not like since we've got this permit, now we have it forever. That was good for one shot and that's it. And we have to do it again if we want to try it again. So, um, but overall, very efficient, effective tool in the toolbox uh, allows us to successfully capture or not capture individuals. If we see one that we say, no, that just doesn't look you know, females with cubs or things like that, that we don't think are in or in the right place, just don't do it. With traps, you don't really have that choice. Your trap's out there and, and it works, whatever comes. So, and a lot less time for capture than, uh, than just general trapping. <clears throat> so uh, we need to give a big thanks to a lot of folks. We had some really talented people that uh, made this operation successful. Kyle Jolly, like I said, from Gates of the Arctic uh, National Park Service. Troy Wojciak, who is Baker Aviation. He is our pilot and uh, incredibly talented pilot. He was, he was, a, he was fun to watch. Uh, the folks at the Forest Service in the Shoshone National Forest who, who did a lot of the early heavy lifting on the permit process, they were indispensable as far as getting that through, you know, sending it back in multiple times for revisions and things like that. It took quite a while. Um, Dave Gustine, who at the time was Teton uh, park biologist and was kind of the first person we reached out to, but during this process, he changed to uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service polar bear project in Alaska and then got stuck up there due to COVID restrictions and travel. So he couldn't make it down for the darting operation. So he didn't get to enjoy any of the work, the fruits of the labor after putting in a lot of the early work with us. And then Mark Pakala, our pilot um, from Dubois who did all the spotter work and again was just crucial to the, to the success of this operation. So, and that's all I've got for you guys. Dan, you guys have to have the coolest job in the world. <laughs> that was that was one of the cooler parts of the hands job, down for sure. But I, I think you know you guys continually show the world that you guys are the undisputed leaders in grizzly bears <clears throat> and the knowledge you guys. We're I think most everybody in the game fish department is extremely proud of you guys and what Thank you're you. doing for us. What what's the uh, the range of those helicopters and how long could you be back there with fuel issues and it we had a fuel truck that would follow around and uh, we really never had to use it because we were you you know we're usually done by you know 10 o'clock in the morning and so um we would leave five o'clock in the morning from the cody airport and we'd make it back um make it back to the fuel truck which would be parked like at the head of the south fork where the road ends or down the wood river um and he would fly to that spot and refuel just to make it back to Cody. But if he had to, he probably could have made it back, you know, so five hours, six hours hmm. on flight. But he was on the ground quite a bit too. You know, we were, we were going between bears, 15, 20 minutes, he would fly, get the darting done, and then you just land it and it sits there turned off until you're done, which hmm. takes an hour, hour and a half. And then you get up in the air again, call the spotter planning and say, you have another bear and he would tell us where he'd found another one while we were working up the other bear and so literally just flying from this spot to this spot and saying there it is and and starting over again it was it went so fast i mean it was from you know having done this this capture work for 20 plus years to do that and have that many captures in a matter of three half days is it's just incredible <clears throat> any questions or comments that's awesome yeah, that was great. 
Anybody in the audience have any questions or comments? All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Very much. Okay. Hey. Um, just a house clearing, members of commission, President Dubia, Joe Condilis from Western Bear Foundation. Could not make it. Um, he had an emergency surgery on his back. He actually sent me the MRI of his back and about made me sick. Um, so, uh, but Joe's very excited to come and talk to you about Western Bear Foundation um, and about what their group has done for bear conservation in Wyoming. So in a future meeting, we'll make that happen when he can actually walk. So thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Agenda item 24. Zach. I, um, so, uh, President Duby, members of the commission today, I'll talk to you about uh, black footed ferrets and kind of our update um, for what has happened over the last year and uh, try to figure this out. So, <laughs> all right. So just as a quick background, the uh, black footed <laughs> ferret is considered the rarest mammal in North America. It is also our only uh, ferret in North America as well. Uh, it's uh, primarily nocturnal, although it can be out kind of in dusk and dawn, uh, but typically you find them out only at night. And we consider them a true prairie dog obligate, so 99% of their diet is prairie dogs. Um, so that's, you know, their primary food source. Uh, to start off, we thought that black-footed ferrets were extinct um, kind of before 1981. And if you um, know in 1981, uh, basically black-footed ferrets were rediscovered in the Titsi uh, by the, uh, the famous dog Shep there, um, who brought a black-footed ferret back to the hog ranch um, and started um, basically this kind of whole process uh, knowing they were no longer extinct. But they started researching ferret populations um, in, uh, in 1986. They noticed that there was the ferret populations were declining in Matitsi, so they moved forward with capturing all the ferrets that they could and bringing them to Sabil. Uh, and at that point in time, they started a captive breeding program. And then, with the success of the captive breeding program in 1991, they were reintroduced into Shirley Basin. Uh, Matitsi was still experiencing plague problems uh, at that point in time, so they were moved to Shirley Basin. And then they were managed there uh, for a number of years. Um, so basically, the kind of the next big step would be in 2015, we had a 10J designation for the entire state, which basically says that any ferret in Wyoming is considered experimental, not essential, uh, which release, uh, relaxes a lot of the regulatory uh, take. So if you're otherwise doing a legal activity, and you accidentally take a ferret, then that's, that's covered. So with that uh, kind of regulatory assurance, uh, we moved forward in 2016 with a release uh, back into Matitsi. And then at this point, I'd also like to make sure that the commission knows that the, um, oh, the, all the releases and the reintroductions are primarily on uh, private lands. So the cooperation of those landowners has been essential to the recovery efforts for this species in Wyoming. And then in 2018, the commission approved a ferret management plan, uh, which will, um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, uh, criteria in that as well during this presentation. Also, I wanted to point out that the ferret management in Wyoming is a very collaborative effort. Um, we have a MOU in place that says that will work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well as 
Um, the Department of Agriculture, Wheaton Pest, uh, Stock Grower State Lands. It, it's a very collaborative effort. You can see the, the wide scope of folks that kind of work on this together. <clears throat> All right, so the ferret management plan, again, this is uh, based on the federal recovery plan uh, so that we make sure when we recover them within Wyoming that we're meeting also these federal obligations. So it's to maintain a uh, minimum population of 341 breeding adults distributed among five or more populations. Uh, maintain a minimum of 30 breeding adults in each population with at least two populations containing a minimum of 100 breeding adults. And then establish at least two populations within whitetail prairie dog colonies and at least one population within blacktail prairie dog colonies. Uh, so I'm going to go over the recovery sites just real quick. Uh, the first one is Shirley Basin. Um, and just to give uh, some information about the map, the gray kind of polygons represent prairie dog colonies. Uh, so we have approximately 150,000 acres of whitetail prairie dog colonies in Shirley Basin. Uh, it's located among a variety of land ownership, uh, primarily private and BLM. And uh, the ferret population is largely self-sustaining. Um, we have some opportunistic releases that we do, uh, and then we monitor them um, every year. So you can see now the highlighted yellow, that is kind of our main study area. It's about 20,000 acres. And we've emphasized this area since about 2006 because it contained the highest known density of ferrets in Shirley Basin. And this is kind of a zoomed in area. Um, back in the 2006, we had about 193 ferrets in that area uh, due to plague or drought or a combination of both. We had that um, population decline. So in 2020, which is the last time we did surveys there, uh, we had 32 ferrets that uh, we knew were alive. Now I will put out there that this is the minimum number alive. It's not how many ferrets we think are there, it's just how many, it's the smallest number we know occur in that area. Um, so there's likely more out there, but at least that's um, what we have. Also, I'll point out that we still have uh, reproduction occurring in there. We saw nine litters in 2020, and I'll discuss what we did in 2021 here in just a second. Um, so we had been focusing since 2006 on this, um, kind of priority area. Uh, however, there hadn't been a systematic survey for prairie dog and populations and habitats for quite a while. So we went through and we basically um, did aerial, looked at aerial imagery to come up with prairie dog uh, colonies where we thought they were. Uh, and we had about 115,000 acres that had uh, cells which had greater than 50% density. So each one of those little dots in the green is basically a cell. Um, and it included about 65,000 acres that we hadn't ever mapped um, on the ground. This is kind of just done through the aerial imagery. Um, so we realized we had a lot of area um, outside of this kind of priority area that we'd like to look at. So in 2021, we were able to get a grant and work with the Working Dogs for Conservation to use scent dogs to go out and do kind of this uh, wide sweeping survey across the Shirley Basin. Uh, basically, the point of this was to get a lot of ground covered to see if there's areas where ferrets occurred that we didn't know about. Um, and um, we'll follow that up later uh, with spotlighting surveys, more intensive groundwork where they do find ferrets. Um, so as part of that effort, we had some, we saw a lot of species, but we did find ferrets as well. Um, so to get into the details on that, the scent dogs covered uh, about 54,000 acres in 2021. Uh, across 13 private landowners, we deployed about 248 cameras for a minimum of eight days each. Uh, so we ended up getting about 157,000 photos taken out there. And this is basically where the scent dogs uh, basically detected something. They showed that they had a scent. And so we set a camera just to verify the effectiveness of the scent dogs. Um, and we're still going through those photos. We're almost done. 
Uh, but as of last month, we'd only gotten through about 34%. I'd say we're probably 99 to 100% now. Uh, so uh, it's just a lot of photos to go through. Also, I guess I'll point out in the circles there, the red circles are where there was uh, ferrets detected. Um, that main focus area is, uh, there's the two orange dots kind of on the right side in the middle of the, of the map. That's the main focus area. So you can see that we did cover quite a bit of Shirley Basin outside of that area. Um, and again, the red circles are where ferrets were detected and the blue circles um, is where we weren't able to find anything. So Zach, how effective were the dogs? Uh, President Doobie, they were, they were very, um, they were fairly effective. Um, sometimes we did have, well, they detected a weasel um, scent as well. Uh, but from what we could tell, uh, they were fairly effective when it came to having positive. Um, when they did detect, they did have at least some kind of ferret or weasel. Yeah. So what's fairly effective? 20%, 30%? Um, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, 100% because we're still going through the last of those photos, but I would say um, definitely over 50, 60%, but I'd have to, um, it's probably likely more, but I, I just don't have that yet, so. All right, for the Matitsi site, um, as a overview, this was established in 2016. Uh, we have about 6,300 acres of whitetail prairie dogs in that area. Um, again, it's primarily private BLM with some state lands there. Uh, so in 2016, they were released. I'd like to point out in 2017 and 18, we had wild reproduction. Uh, we were very excited about this. We did know we had a little bit of plague in the area. Uh, but it seemed like ferret populations were doing fine. We were doing uh, starting some plague control as well. Uh, however, in 2019, 20, uh, the population crashed out there. Um, this year with a survey we did, we found uh, four minimum number alive. We did have uh, six that were seen, so we weren't sure though it last two. Uh, however, this was before releases, which occurred. Um, so we knew at least we had four to six individuals out there uh, before we released. Um, and we're continuing with uh, management out there and plague control, and I'll bring this up here. Again, we had plague confirmed starting in 2016. It seemed to gotten worse until about 2018. Um, we lost about 1,800 acres of uh, prairie dogs, uh, and the population was down about 73%. Um, percent. And however, this year we were seeing prairie dogs that were uh, pregnant. This seemed like they were starting to come back a little bit. So we're hopeful, uh, optimistic that next year we'll start to see a increase back in populations on that recovery site. And we're, what we're doing about that is we're doing, uh, we're applying Delta dust to that area. So basically uh, wildlife services, big thanks to them. They're uh, driving around on ATVs and basically um, applying Delta dust into prairie dog burrows to control the fleas, uh, to hopefully control the plague. Um, and I'd like to give a big thanks to uh, the people who've been helping us purchase that Delta dust, uh, including the BLM, uh, Friends of Ferrets, the Smithsonian, um, and uh, Game and Fish have put some money towards that as well through the top years. Um, we're also starting to talk about, and I'll mention this again, uh, possibly using Fipronel, which is a different kind of uh, plague control, uh, per, uh, flea control. Uh, so we'll see um, how that might progress into the future. Okay, so where are we at in terms of our management plan? Uh, right now, uh, for the first one, we have more than 36 unique individuals among two sites. So we're still a little bit below that 341, or quite a bit below. <laughs> um, uh, we have maintained a minimum of 30 breeding adults. So Matitsi has a potential for 30 breeding adults based on its size. However, we only had four to six observed. And in Shirley Basin, we have the potential for over 100 <coughs> breeding adults. Uh, and we currently have a little bit over 30. 
Um, and that's at least in that main study area. We need to figure out what's in these other outlying areas where the scent dogs have detected ferrets. Uh, so there's likely quite a bit more out there we just don't know about. Um, and establish, the last one is establish uh, recovery populations. Right now, Matitsi and Shirley Basin are both in white-tailed prairie dog colonies. Uh, so at some point in time, uh, we'll also need to think about a black-tailed prairie dog colony. Um, so to get to some of our act other activities that we conducted this year, so we did uh, ferret releases. So all releases occurred in uh, September of this year. We had 30 ferrets allocated for Matitsi. However, we didn't feel that the habitat could support uh, 30 ferrets. So we released 20, uh, 10 male and 10 female. And those other 10 ferrets were uh, released into Shirley Basin. We'll likely request uh, more ferrets again for Matitsi in uh, 2022. Uh, and special thanks to Commissioner Lundvall for uh, helping release some of those ferrets out at Matitsi. Uh, so for our upcoming activities, basically, we'll continue scent dog surveys in uh, 2022, and we'll also go out and spotlight some of those areas that the dogs are detecting. Um, and we'll, at that point in time, discuss if we need to do any releases in some of these satellite populations to bolster them. Um, typically, when we catch a ferret, we do also vaccinate it for plague and distemper. So that's another reason why we try to do these surveys is to try to uh, vaccinate the individuals. Uh, in Matitsi, we'll likely do another release. Um, also, we'll continue plague control efforts, which might include as well uh, Fipronel as well. And then uh, there's, we've talked about we still need to have uh, more recovery populations. There's nothing in the works or any plans for that right now. Um, however, uh, it's something what we've decided to do is basically focus on those two populations that we have and try to get a better handle on them before uh, spreading out the resources we have available for another site. Um, but maybe in the next uh, three to five years, that might be something more that we want to talk about. Uh, and with that, um, I'd just like to thank all the landowners that allow us on their property, as well as the landowners who host ferret populations. Again, without them, uh, this really wouldn't be a possible within the state. Uh, so uh, I guess with that, I entertain any questions. Any questions for Zach? Uh, I got one Commissioner question. Roberts? How do, how do they um, coexist with the badgers and the other thing in the same area? The yeah, um, President Duby, Commissioner Roberts. Uh, the, the badgers are known to um, Oh, predate on ferrets so they can. Uh, so typically in areas where you have high badger populations, uh, you have a little bit less ferrets in those areas. Um, so uh, they're not to say they won't occur in the same areas, but um, a lot of times you see a little bit of a separation. Do the eagles go after them or anything else? Or they... Uh, they, they could, but since they're primarily, it's more owls. Yeah. So how many prairie dogs as a ferret eat? I mean, one a week? Um, President Duby, they, 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 <laughs> yeah, they typically eat uh, one prairie dog every three days. Hmm. I bet none of you knew that. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the uh, pregnant or lactating females, uh, because they need more energy, will likely even increase that amount. So, Is there any, uh, like, where the ferrets at? Is there any signs posted it in case any of the prey dog hunters come out and say, "Oh, um, President DB Commissioner Roberts"? Right now, there's not signs that are out. Um, a lot of it's uh, again on private property, and the landowners are aware that um, you know the ferrets are those in the areas. Uh, so, if they're allowing prey dog uh, hunting, uh, we're just hoping that um, they notify it. But again, typically the ferrets are underground. Uh, during the day, so they, we haven't seen a lot of uh, problems with that. Any other questions? Commissioner Broca? Um, they're right now, so all the, the ferrets were moved from Sabeel uh, to the Ferret Recovery Center. They, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service 
uh, made a special facility for them uh, in uh, Colorado. Uh, President Newby, Commissioner Brokaw, the, 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 it depends on what state and what site you're talking about. Some of them are being heavily impacted by plague, uh, just like Matitsi has been. Um, there's a few sites such as Kanata Basin or the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, uh, which have been more like Shirley Basin and able to kind of larger and able to have self-sustaining populations, but many of the sites have been uh, impacted the same way, at least the Matitsi has. Are you leaving now? Are you leaving now? Pretty soon. Pretty soon. Mr. President, I got a little bit of history, if I could. Oh, absolutely. Back in the not early 90s, when they first started the ferret recovery program, I was raising and had a commercial rabbitry in Manville, Wyoming. And I had a contract for over a year feeding rabbits to the ferrets in Seville. It was kind of a neat job. It was pretty neat. We kind of parted company when they wanted me to start live trapping prairie dogs. I just didn't go there. <laughs> but I, I did feed a lot of ferrets for a while. It's pretty cool. All right. Well, thank you very much. Any questions for Zach in the audience? Oh, I, I was just going to publicly say thank you for letting us go out. That was the highlight of my year, my daughter still talks about it. You guys are doing amazing work there. She's got her stuffed ferret. She sleeps with every night and named half the ferrets that we released. And it was really just cool to see kids there really understanding that heart of conservation. So thank you for letting us be involved. You guys are doing great work. Yes, and, and, and anybody's welcome next year if we decide to do the, the same, your, your daughter too. We'll be back. <laughs> okay. so. Thank you also for your help on the tour of Sinks Canyon. Appreciate that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, number 23, Brian. President oh, Doobie. Okay, why don't we, or do you let, let's take, take 10 minutes. Got it. <clears throat> what it is? Um, as you know, we've, uh, the last couple of commission meetings, we've been showcasing our WHMAs, and I just kind of wanted to let you guys know, you know, the, we have 44 WHMAs across the state. Um, about 450,000 acres with over 200 public access areas. And um, you guys are the owners and managers of those properties. So uh, we feel it important that you kind of get to see what's out there. So if you can't do it in person, we'll keep doing these uh, virtual tours for you. Sounds good, thank you. Yep. President Dewey, members of the commission, uh, thank you for inviting me here to uh, give you a quick overview on Ocean Lake and San Mesa WHMAs. Um, as I was putting this, uh, this presentation together, the one thing that really, really struck me was almost with each slide, there's, there, there's, a, there's a cooperator. It's not just the department um, and certainly not our outfit, just, just doing it together. And so that's why I, I subtitled it a story of cooperation. I think you'll see that thread uh, pretty much through, throughout the presentation. Now we're cooking. Great, thanks. Um, okay, so just a quick uh, geographic overview. Uh, 
of what we're talking about. So obviously we're here in Riverton. This is Highway 26 going up to Dubois, um, 789 up to Thermop and, and over to, to Casper just to orient you. So this, this general area here is what we refer to as Ocean Lake uh, WHMA. Yeah, that, that'll work. If you go back one, we can we can run with that. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so 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 here's Ocean Lake WHMA, and uh, this area here is San Mesa WHMA. Uh, San Mesa is basically composed of these these riparian corridors along Five Mile Creek and Muddy Creek, and then uh, this area here just to the to the west of Boise and Reservoir. Um, this slide uh, I, I put up basically that's to for some similarities of Ocean Lake and San Mesa that they share. Uh, the two two big cooperators on both the WHMAs are the Bureau of Reclamation uh, and Midville Irrigation District. Uh, so the Bureau was got involved back in 1905 when uh, effectively what encompasses the Midville Irrigation District was ceded uh, from the Wind River Indian Reservation, uh, what is known as a Riverton unit. And the Bureau owns, in addition to uh, quite a bit of the ground in the withdrawal area, they own the, the, the infrastructure, the dams, the canals, the headgate sort of thing. Uh, and we manage uh, these WHMAs, which is their ownership on behalf of them through uh, a 20 year memorandum of agreement. Uh, the present one's set to, to sunset in 2026. The other big operator we, we deal with um, and, and work with uh, Pretty much on a daily basis out there is Midville Irrigation District. Uh, they're, they were established in 1921, and they operate, manage, and maintain all the the bureau's infrastructure out there, the headgates, etc. Um, they service uh, delivering water to about 73,000 acres um, that you can see on this uh, this aerial photograph, um, and all the uh, the water rights out water rights within the Midville Irrigation District. Are all appropriated as they would be on any other uh, private land. So to hop into to Ocean Lake itself, uh, just some quick stats: uh, about thirteen thousand acres in total. Uh, about ten and a half thousand acres are BOR ground. BOR ground is largely focused on this this eastern side of the lake. Uh, Commission-owned ground, the twenty-four hundred acres, is largely uh, on the north and in, in the north northwest corner of the WHMA. Uh, of that uh, commission-owned property, about 662 are irrigated acres, and there's also about 375 acres of uh, hunting access easements that I'll get into a little later. Uh, general area of the lake is about 6,000 uh, acres. And, and the reason Ocean Lake is a thing, it's a, it's a natural lowland or sump. Um, so when the BOR was, was doing the engineering to lay out Midvale, uh, they recognized that. And, and basically use it as a water collection area. And so you can see what look like streams, but they're, uh, oh, that's, I'm sorry, I'm trying to use a laser pointer. And I think I'm, uh, I'm not gonna use a laser pointer. I'll put it down. Uh, <laughs> me and technology. Uh, so the, um, there are drains that come into the lake. So, so basically it's wastewater that comes off of the irrigation system, collects an ocean lake, and then is exported to the east, eventually to into Boyson through Wind River uh, Canyon, the Bighorn system, and into Montana. So that's kind of how we fit uh, into it. Uh, our management priorities out there are waterfowl production, uh, pheasant hunting, and the fishery itself in Ocean Lake. Great. Uh, so some of the uses at Ocean Lake, uh, obviously hunting, um, waterfowl, pheasant, deer hunting, uh, and small game. Uh, it's it's has been and, and is quite a robust fishery both during the summer and uh, as ice fishing, trapping, boating, um, and and just myriad water sports, stand up paddleboarding, kayaking, etc. Uh, as well as camping, uh, there there has been, like everywhere, uh, an increased of exurban development out uh, in this area. So we're seeing an increase in non-consumptive uses like dog walking, uh, birding, picnicking, and last but certainly not least, asparagus picking, uh, which is quite uh, an important spring pastime for uh, the locals. 
in uh, in a pavilion area. So the kind of standard BOR uh, recreation facilities, picnic shelters, um, outhouses, boat ramps. There are five boat ramps around around the lake. Uh, we have two piers uh, at uh, two of those more developed boat ramps, um, outhouses, campground, picnic shelters. But as I said, is in the kind of the important uses, waterfowl production is, is, is primary. So we have approximately uh, 10 wetlands or, or pond complexes out there. Uh, it's about 350 acres of overall wetland area in addition to 400 acres of perimeter around the lake. Um, and uh, starting in oh, 2013, 2014, uh, Derek Lemon, who was our habitat and access biologist uh, for, for Ocean Lake in this country, uh, started a program uh, where he reached out to the BLM and the Forest Service and the Volunteer Fire Department uh, to see if we could get some uh, prescribed fire going on out there. The soils at Ocean Lake are such that that it results in, in kind of a, uh, a monoculture of cattails out there. And as, as you were well aware of, uh, just, you know, monoculture of anything is not, you know, a lack of diversity does not benefit uh, any kind of animal species, um, waterfowl included. Uh, so, so work with them to develop a program where each spring uh, we'll go around and burn one or two, depending on the situation, uh, area around, around the ponds. And this, so this serves to increase diversity, vegetative diversity, uh, by knocking down uh, the, the cattails, generating uh, a bulrush component. It also has a secondary benefit, uh, not so much for us, but for, for the agencies that are partnering with us and actually doing the burning, that this is the spring, they're bringing their seasonal employees on, and this is kind of their first use of fire for the year. So it's a good refresher for, for our partner agencies on that. So it's, it's a win-win there. Additionally, we have an aerator on the, the north end of the lake uh, that has an associated human presence closure. So that's during the midwinter that birds that don't move out of the country uh, have open water uh, to, to utilize. Uh, and we have a, a pretty substantial partnership with Ducks Unlimited. And I'll talk about a couple projects uh, at both Ocean Lake and, and San Mesa um, next. This is the most recent wetland development uh, at Ocean Lake and where we partnered with, with Ducks Unlimited. Uh, creatively enough, we call it the Northwest Wetlands. It's located right in the Northwest corner of WHMA. Um, and so, so Ducks Unlimited did all the engineering and the contracting to develop this. So this, you see this engineering drawing uh, on the left-hand side, basically uh, consists of six wetland cells uh, with a with a pump and a pipeline, so so we have the ability to to um, inundate to whatever depth we want any or all of the the cells on any given year. Uh, our, our target there's a lot of water in this country, but there's but outside the irrigation system there's actually a dearth of water. So the design here is to provide kind of shoulder season uh, habitat when when the birds are migrating north and south uh, prior to uh, and following the irrigation system. Um, so DU built it and uh, gave us the keys and, and we had the management responsibility to, to keep this thing rolling and, and do uh, all the infrastructure maintenance and, and management. Um, these are shallow wetlands, so basically providing a food source uh, as well as during the fall hunting opportunity and, and wildlife watching in the spring. The other big use at Ocean Lake is our uh, is, is pheasant hunting season and our put and take pheasant program. So we get birds from the Sheridan Bird Farm. Um, it's a twice weekly release. We meet them over in Shoshone uh, and release the birds. Uh, we release about 2,000 birds annually and that's split between Ocean Lake and San Mesa. Uh, as throughout the state, this is an extremely popular uh, use of the WHMA. Um, but we are, uh, you're getting close to, to capacity. You can, the, the graph on the, on the left-hand side is basically our set pheasant stamp sales, um, which using as a surrogate for hunter numbers, um, and you can just see the growth uh, over the last uh, six years. Um, we've 
noted that the, the, the capacity problem uh, is an issue and the, the, the region has worked to spread uh, release sites out in an effort to, to, to mitigate just overcrowding and you know, BBs falling on people or on neighbors' roofs, that sort of thing. Um, so it's thus far, it's, it's worked well. So I spoke about the irrigated ground, uh, 662 acres. Uh, this is all through uh, flood irrigation or irrigated pipe. Um, the, the goal here is, is basically to provide uh, cover for, for pheasant and waterfowl. Um, additionally, Justin Ryan, uh, who's our current habitat and access biologist, out here uh, has been uh, putting in food plots uh, to benefit uh, both pheasant hunters and, and the waterfowl. There's about 20 acres and kind of these smaller couple acre plots spread around the, the WHMA. During the, the winter, we have a, a winter grazing program, uh, basically in uh, January and February. We have all this irrigated ground. We, we don't hay this ground, so in a, a way to uh, remove that biomass and, and create more, more uh, uh, increased plant vigor. Uh, we come in, graze it off on a five-year rotation. So basically we have five pastures set up across uh, the, the irrigated ground on the WHMA and move each year we'll graze one of the five and, and rotate that through. Uh, and that works out well. Okay. The fishery uh, the, the species we have in, in the lake are crappie, burbot, uh, perch, and walleye. Historically, Ocean Lake was, was quite the renowned uh, crappie fishery, but that's, that's, that's segued into being a more of a walleye fishery, uh, largely due to sediment that's uh, being transported into, into the lake. Um, fish division stocks approximately 320,000 walleye annually in Ocean Lake. Uh, they come from North Dakota. Um, and since 2013, it's really, uh, really become quite the, quite the walleye fishery. Um, and, and talking to those guys, the, the future looks quite bright. Um, it's so good, in fact, that uh, in talking to Craig Amadio, our, our fish supervisor, uh, he relayed that, they're, that Fish Division is looking at Ocean Lake as a potential uh, egg source for the, the walleye spawning program that uh, is being evaluated at SPEES. Um, so we'll see, see how, how that goes. Um, on the downside, we're also subject to harmful algal blooms. Uh, basically, this is, this is an explosion of cyanobacteria uh, associated with increased temperature, water temperatures and uh, nutrient loading. Obviously, it occurs uh, late summer into the fall, depending on how, how the fall temps go. Um, so DEQ does the water monitoring. Uh, we post signs, not, not super, it can, it can create a, a rash or something to, to humans. Our, our, our main concern is dogs, particularly in the fall that are hunting on the WHMA, uh, and that can, can drink the water. And we haven't had it here, but elsewhere in the country, dogs have died from ingesting, uh, too great a volume of water with, uh, with these, uh, harmful algal, algal blooms. Finally, at Ocean Lake, we have uh, the easements we talked to. Um, the Mile High Ranch easement, about 90 acres, uh, just adjacent and north of uh, the WHMA. This is, we purchased a uh, purchased hunting easement uh, in the fall to, to just provide a little buffer and increased area for, for pheasant hunting um, on this area. The, the other uh, easement, is the Killaroo public access easement. Um, I'm gonna give you a Cliff Notes history of this, of a, a, a more lengthy story. Um, so that's the, the kind of island piece up in the, the Northwest corner of the, the left-hand map. Uh, it's approximately 240 acres. We, we did call this the, the, the Maxon area. So back in 2017, 2018, uh, I guess it was 2016, 2017, um, we had a, uh, a landowner just south of Lander um, who had land on Table Mountain, who uh, we were talking about that on our, our sinks tour 
on Monday and just the value of, of Table Mountain that from, from a mule deer habitat standpoint. And he, he had about 1900 acres that he was interested in uh, enrolling in a conservation easement uh, to, to protect. He was, getting, he was getting old in age and just wanted to have a legacy uh, for his ranch. So we were, we were quite motivated to, to get a conservation easement uh, on this ground because there were adjacent conservation easements and it was pretty ripe for, for development. Um, unfortunately, at that time frame, uh, the department was going through some, some budget struggles and our acquisition budget wasn't quite as robust as, as it is today. So he wanted to do something, we wanted to do something, and we kind of kept, uh, kept talking, didn't want to drop the ball. And he also is a neighbor of ours uh, adjacent to the max and to the north and to the east. So he floated the idea. He was like, well, what if we trade, you know, value for value, deed of ground for, for the conservation, conservation easement ground? I honestly didn't think that that was going to pass muster with anybody. But uh, once again, I was proved wrong, thankfully. And so we worked through the process. And basically what we did was uh, we traded the 240 acres of deed to ground. We retained a hunting easement and an access easement. Uh, for that piece of ground, uh, signed a, a separate MOU so we wouldn't graze it from, from June till after the first of the year. So we'd have a growing season, provide cover, we could still plant birds there. And we also uh, put a conservation easement on the 1900 acres on Table Mountain, as well as uh, a hunting access easement. So basically we netted uh, 1900 acres of uh, huntable area, as well as tying up uh, some of this important mule deer winter range and maintaining what we had to hunt out, out at Ocean Lake. Uh, so really feel like this is a, a, a true win-win um, for a whole variety of species as well as hunters. Okay, Sam Mason, we're almost done. Um, about 18,000 acres, it's all BOR land. Um, we have no deeded out there. Um, again, we managed this through a 20 year MLA with the BOR. Similar management goals. Um, and then, as I said, the kind of three areas of operation, the repairing corridors uh, in, the, in the main area adjacent to Poison. So just a, just a quick visual representation of the repairing corridors along uh, Five Mile and Muddy Creek on the left-hand and right-hand side, respectively. Uh, basically, what these corridors uh, offer is uh, we don't plant any birds there. So there's, there's wild pheasants out there, uh, deer hunting. And there's numerous landowners that we interact with. Uh, basically, the, typically the landowners are uh, inter intersect perpendicular with these repairing corridors. Um, so, so lots of friends and neighbors in that country. And kind of the main area just, just east of, or excuse me, west of Boyson, uh, the three main areas are, are Bass Lake or Lake Kamehameha on the, the south end, the three pivot fields, and then the wetland complex to, to the north. Uh, farm fields, there's about 560 acres. We have three pivots out there. Um, the beauty of this is that we have a contract farmer um, that we put out to bid, farmer bids on it, and then we have stipulations where uh, they have to leave a certain percentage of the grains or, uh, that they grow each year to provide uh, food for the, for the pheasants that we plant, as well as fields for, for waterfowl to, to land on and be, be hunted. This is the same slide that you saw, but just to, uh, for Ocean Lake, but uh, this is, Sam Mace is also part of our, our pheasant stocking program there. So everything are, uh, applies uh, that I mentioned um, previously on the Ocean Lake side. Wetlands, again, this is, this project uh, just finished up uh, in the spring, or early summer of this year. This was another partnership with, uh, with DU, uh, but all, as well as, uh, BOR, State Engineer's Office, uh, Midville Irrigation District, and, and a, a number of funders. Um, the, the wetlands complex out there was, was pretty benign, basically just two large uh, ponds. Um, so there was, saw, saw the potential to add some uh, three cells between the two pond areas um, where we could utilize the, the effluent from the upstream pond on the, the left-hand side, capture that and provide some of these shallow uh, wetlands, again, benefiting uh, waterfowl between, you know, on either side of the irrigation system. 
as well as increasing hunter opportunity. And finally, Bass Lake or Kamehameha, um, it's, it's referred to synonymously, about 450 acres. Uh, and this is also part of the, the Midville, Midville Water Advance System, a little further to the west, closer to Boysen. Uh, the fishery here is managed for largemouth, bat, largemouth bass. There's also uh, musky perch, bluegill, and grass carp. Um, unlike Ocean Lake, the problem here is that the water's not dirty enough. There's, uh, it's, it's too clean. There's a, there's a, a robust uh, cattail component on the in-stream side of, of the lake. And as, as you well know, wetlands are, you know, they, they clean the water. Well, it does too good a job. It doesn't let enough sediment into the lake. Um, so that results in uh, basically a stunted fish population. Um, so Joe Daramidi, our, uh, one of our, our two fish biologists and landers, they're working with Midville Irrigation District to, to do that. To, he's, he's worked on uh, excavating a channel through there to, to try to move more sediment in uh, and, and more food for, for the fish. So kind of a unique problem there. Uh, additionally, uh, water sports use uh, during the summer um, uh, out of uh, Bass Lake. In, in the that's like it being adjacent to Boysen. Uh, there's not a fee associated with the entrance to Bass Lake. So, so this is uh, the people that don't want to go to Boysen and pay the day fee. Uh, they tend to come here and it turns into quite the party spot. Um, we have to deal with from time to time. Uh, we don't have the uh, harmful algal blooms uh, that we do at, um, at Ocean Lake, but we do have the swimmer's itch, which is a parasitic flatworm and um, can create itchy locations in certain parts of the anatomy. Um, so we sign that and, and recommend against fishing or swimming, excuse me. Um, so the question side slide, uh, I, I put all these guys up here, I'm presenting this, but, but this, is the, this is the regional personnel that actually do the work on the ground. Um, I'm back in the office pushing papers around, but, but this crew does, does all the heavy lifting and, and gets all these projects that I've talked to done. So wanted to give them, uh, all, all uh, representation here and just, they, they, they all work super well together. We have a great team here. Um, so yeah, they're, they're the folks that, that do all the actual work. <laughs> but entertain any questions if you have any. Thank you, Brian. Any questions, comments? Any questions from the audience? Awesome. Thank you very much, Brian. Thanks for your help with uh, Sinks Canyon as well. Thank you. Mr. McBarnes. President Doobie, members of the commission, good to be with you all as always. Uh, my name is Chris McBarnes and I serve as president of the Wildlife Fund. For those of you watching at home that might not know who the Wildlife Fund is, we act as a nonprofit partner to Game and Fish. Um, so many great partners across the state, so many great NGOs, a lot of them have been mentioned today and we're just lucky to be one of those individuals. Uh, so thank you. Do want to say it was an honor um, and I thank Deputy Director Kennedy for allowing us to sponsor the 100th anniversary uh, reception last night of the commission. Congratulations. What a hallmark. President Doobie really applauds you for having the vision to put all that together. And uh, just to get to meet people like Norm. Uh, Norm, <laughs> you're my hero, man. <laughs> I won't say that about the guy sitting next to you, but I'll say that. About <laughs> no, that was really an honor. And, and I want you all to know that that was sponsored 100% by our board, our board of directors. They stepped up. Actually, our vice chairman, Bruce Shackelford, was the first one and said, we're going to pay for this. And so the, the entire board shipped in, um, which is really neat, I think speaks a lot to the organization. So we can go to the next slide, Rebecca. So just my presentation is going to be really brief today because I know we all need to get on the road. So I want to do an uh, introduction to new board members. We're adding a couple uh, to our team. And then we have an exciting announcement regarding wildlife tourism for tomorrow. So I think reflection of the organization and how we're growing is the type of people that we are attracting to actually serve uh, on our board. Our bylaws state that we will have no less than four and no more than 13 members on our board. Up to about a month ago, we had five voting board members, um, but we have been strategically recruiting individuals um, 
that align with our missions, our mission and values. And so the first gentleman I, I want to introduce, and he can't be here today because of a, a very busy schedule, um, but that's Mr. Greg Hill. Uh, Greg hails from Wilson. He was one of our Evening of Note hosts. Greg is um, the president and global chief operating officer of Hess Corporation, a global independent energy company. Uh, Greg does have a mechanical engineering degree from UW, um, so he is a home state boy, and he brings a wealth of experience in regards to fundraising and nonprofit because he just got done being chairman of the UW Foundation. So Greg's really going to provide a shot in the arm for us. And in regards to wildlife, not only is he an avid angler uh, and hunter, but he served on the Blue Ribbon Panel on Sustaining America's Diverse Fish and Wildlife Resources, created in 2014 by AFWA. So um, we welcome Greg to the team. Um, and this is a reflection of how this organization is growing at rapid pace with incredibly quality folks. Next slide, please. And then this gentleman needs no introduction. Uh, the picture is not quite as cute as the ferrets that we saw in a couple presentations ago, but it'll do. Uh, his name is Taylor Phillips, and Taylor's become a, a good friend of mine, a guy I look up to. You will be hard pressed to find a gentleman more passionate about wildlife and tourism than Taylor Phillips. But Taylor hails from Jackson. He's got degrees in environmental science and environmental philosophy. Founder and owner of Jackson Hole Eco Tour Adventures, premier wildlife watching uh, business from Jackson. Taylor enjoys to hunt, fish, mountain bike, and backcountry ski. And he's got two youngins at home, Canyon and Isla, who are just amazing. And just like me, he married up because his wife, Brooke, is incredible. And Taylor, of course, uh, is the creator of Wildlife Tourism for Tomorrow, which is an initiative underneath uh, the umbrella of the Wildlife Fund. Uh, and before I go to the next slide, I, I just want to mention to the commission as well, you know, we are seeing great strides in this organization. The support, the people coalescing, um, our fundraising numbers, I dare say, they're going to be up about 170 to 180 percent in comparison to last year. So we're, we're very proud of that. Um, now, many of those gifts are restricted to projects. So now what we need to do is, is take our story to the street, which we are, about how our organization is getting things done so that we can raise unrestricted dollars to keep the lights on, which that's the next phase and that's very natural. As a part of doing that, um, thanks to John Kennedy again, I had the opportunity to go to the all regional meeting in Cheyenne, really trying to get around the state and connect with the folks that make up Game and Fish. These are incredible people, incredible employees, and we want our, our message to be very clear. This, this is their fund, this is your fund. Um, we need their feedback, we need their engagement, which they are, and it's wonderful, but. We just want you to know that not only are we trying to reach out to donors, trying to connect with people who make this organization what it is uh, and gain their buy-in and gain their trust. And that's something that's on us, but we're taking steps to do that. And I hope this is another step today because we um, do have a, a check presentation to make. Rebecca, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, wildlife tourism for tomorrow, it's growing. Uh, you guys gave us a challenge to try to diversify the revenue stream that helps complete on the ground wildlife projects because it's done mostly on the backs of traditional hook and bullet individuals like myself. Um, but we know to get more done, we need to tap into this billion dollar plus tourism economy and bring some of those dollars to bear, those resources to bear. That's why the wildlife funds here. So you look at all these businesses and, and just since April, these are all businesses that we've signed up for wildlife tourism for tomorrow who are voluntarily giving to on the ground projects across Wyoming. And we're gonna be making our first check presentation today. And this is all happening because of this man right behind me and that's Mr. Taylor Phillips. So next slide, Rebecca and Taylor, the floor is yours. Uh, President Duby, Commission, um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, Chris, thank you so much for um, the, the warm welcome. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you um, through all this and getting to know you. And um, yeah, just, I, I love the idea of engaging this large industry, the billion dollar tourism industry to help protect the resource that the tourism industry needs. Diane Chober, she told me personally, wildlife is the one of the, it is the main driver of tourism to this state. So it's, it's time that the tourism sector across the state chips in. Um, so the businesses that you saw listed were, were, we got them on our site. They provided the donations in just the past month. Um, I was a bit of a sabbatical this past summer, so we couldn't really work on this project. Um, but now I've got a GM hired for my company. So I am 
all in. And I couldn't do it without this guy. Um, thank you for your support, Chris. So we're, we're, it's unfortunate, Trout Unlimited, they couldn't be with us today, but we're, we're thrilled um, to have businesses like you saw previously um, that have given, um, and we have a $20,000 check um, that we are we're excited to present to, uh, to, to Trout Unlimited um, for their efforts at the Spread Creek Project, uh, where they're installing fish screens to prevent native cutthroat trout moving into the irrigation ditches up at the Elk Ranch there just uh, south of Moran. So this is the first of, of many donations um, that we will be providing to um, you know, groups across the state that do just incredible work. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, we are, we're moving this initiative you know, across the state um, and we do want to tap into the tourism sector across the straight, across the state to do that. So, you know, I, I ask commissioners, um, you know, you know, help us with this mission to engage this billion dollar industry to support wildlife. Thank you. Very much. So the reason we picked the Spread Creek Fish Passage as one of our aquatic projects is it aligns with the vision and the mission and the strategic goals of Game and Fish. Every project that we pick, we're going to make sure the department's on board, your people are on the ground working on this, and, and they are. And so when the meeting adjourns, I'd like to invite our, our chief of fisheries up and um, Commissioner Roberts, since this is your district, sir, we'd love to get a, a picture with you folks so that, that we can archive this memory. Great job, Taylor. Uh, next slide. Okay. So just briefly talk to you about the, our, introduce some new board members of ours and, and wildlife tourism for tomorrow. And we can go to the final slide. And again, just wanna thank you all for your support. I'm so proud to represent this great agency and we can take any questions you might have. Well, unbelievable. Thank you very much. Chris, you're a godsend to this organization. We appreciate it. You represent the commission extremely well. Thank you. Taylor, unbelievable effort. I think you ought to explain to the public that may be listening, you know, there's a lot of states trying to do what you've done, trying to get the non-license holders to participate in, in wildlife uh, management. And I think the model that you guys are, are pursuing, uh, the flexibility uh, to allow any type of business to participate, I think is unique. And uh, I'll bet other states will be copying it soon. If you would, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you, President. Um, no, very much. Um, other states around the country, they've definitely reached out to us, you know, very interested in what we're doing. And, you know, kind of this concept of engaging industries, other industries that benefit from wild, it's not new, but no one's been able to, to kind of tap into it. No one's been able to kind of figure out the, the best way to move forward with it. Um, you know, there's been ideas of, you know, taxes, you know, on entrance fees or on binoculars, backpacks, you know, no one wants another tax. But, um, you know, we're, we're focused on just encouraging businesses that, that understand the connection between, you know, wildlife and tourism to, to organically give. And, you know, five years, 10 years down, down the road, um, you know, this will bring in, you know, tens of millions, if not more uh, money for wildlife conservation. And it, it's going to benefit the hunters, anglers, wildlife watchers, um, everyone. So it just it seems like a no brainer, and and it's it's time that the tourism sector across the you know across the, the country really um, should step up. So excited. Any questions or comments? And just one, Commission Roberts. I'd like to thank you personally for putting the commission in direction for this. Uh, since my short time on the commission in the beginning, we've always emphasized that they need to try to tap into that residence, that, uh, that sect of people that we've never been able to get to. And I, I think with your, with your guidance with these folks and everything, it's, uh, it's well served. I appreciate that. Well, it's definitely a team effort. It was, wasn't, there was a lot of us involved. A lot of commissioners that came last night were involved in this project. So we appreciate it. Any questions from the audience? Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess we're at the call to the public. Does anybody have anything they want to say? Get off their chest. All right. Well, thank you very much. It has been a, a very excellent meeting. Thank you very much. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Commissioner Bird, seconded by Commissioner Lundvall to adjourn. All those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, thank you.